So our Torah portion today is called Vayechel. Vayechel. And he assembled, or he gathered. And it begins in Exodus 35, and it goes over into chapter 38. He said, Then Moses gathered all the congregation of Israel together and said to them, These are the words which the Lord has commanded you to do. Work shall be done for six days. But the seventh day shall be a holy day for you, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. And so there's a tradition that this assembly took place the day after Moses returns from Sinai. You know, he had to go back up with the two stones that he has hewn, and God writes the, the commandments on them as before. And so when he comes down from the mountain, he gathers the people. And so as we read this portion, you, you should see that a good bit of it is about the building of the Mishkan. He's given the blueprint, he's given the details, how it's to be done, and the furnishings, etc. But now this is going to actually get into the beginning of the building of the Mishkan. That's what a good port part of this portion is assigned to. However, it doesn't begin that way. It begins with reminding us of the importance of the Shabbat, which is to imply that the building of the Mishkan, the, the, the working in the building of the Mishkan was not to supersede the sanctity of the Shabbat because it is called literally a day of holiness, a day when things are set aside. And apparently that even included the building of the Mishkan. As, as important as that was, it was not to supersede the sanctity of the Shabbat. And so what can we glean from that? What can that speak to us? First of all, I believe that Shabbat, from the very beginning, it testifies of God's existence, it testifies of God's sovereignty over the universe. One of the reasons that we observe the Shabbat is not just to have a day off, but to acknowledge that he is the King of Kings and he is the Lord of Lords. He, he is the sovereign of the universe. And from the beginning, he is the one who set this time aside. And so acknowledgement of his sovereignty supersedes anything else that we could do in service to him. In other words, if we do not consider him as Lord, why would we serve him, All right? Which is why, at least I think this, in Jewish reckoning of the Ten Commands, the first one isn't about graven images. The first one is this, Exodus 20, verse 2. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. That's the first command. Because again, if we, we can't just skip over that one or gloss over it, that's really important. Because if we don't acknowledge him as Lord, then why would we do all these other things in service to him? So that being understood, nevertheless, Moses assembled the nation and he invited all of the people in the nation to participate. We talked about that last week. To participate in the building of the Mishkan. And so, as I said, this Torah portion repeats a lot of what was covered in the previous, not just last week, but the week before that and even the week before that. But in this portion, it describes in a lot of detail how those instructions were to be carried out. It describes the enthusiasm of the people to bring their contributions, so much so that Moses has to say, that's enough. But it also focuses on the artisans, Bezalel, Aholia, and all the different craftsmen who used their skills and talents. That's how they contributed to the building of the Mishkan. So if we go back three, four tour portions about the contributions, how you build this, how that is to be, and all the different components, consider how much of Scripture has been devoted to the design and the, the, the building of the tabernacle. And so all the, these details, all this time and, and, and scripture that is devoted to that, here is what it speaks to me. It illustrates the immense responsibility that was given to Israel, to God's people, in providing a place for God's presence to rest and to reside among his people. Because from the be very beginning, what has he wanted to do? To have a relationship, right? So... He does his part, and it's up to us to do ours. And so there is a great responsibility upon God's people to make sure that we create an environment that invites his presence to be here, and not just to visit and leave, but to remain, to abide with us. That was one of the primary reasons for Israel's existence, so that God would dwell among them. 
literally in them. Because what happened to Israel when his presence departed? It was calamity. It was destruction. I, I use this example a lot. The tabernacle in Shiloh, when Eli and Hophni and Pincus, they were the priests there and all the wicked things that they were, they were doing. And God warned them, here's something bad's coming. You know, you, you're letting these things continue. And eventually his presence was removed. And then came the destruction of the tabernacle at Shiloh. The same is true for the first temple. The same is true for the second temple. So when his presence is not among his people, that's not a good thing. It's going to be chaos. It's going to be destruction. It's going to be calamity. And so as a congregation, do the math. <laughs> we want his presence here. Do we not? And everybody, starting with me and Beth, but to everybody in this room, and everybody who's out there, we all have a responsibility. We have a shared responsibility in creating an environment where his presence is not only welcome, but, de de but desires to abide with us and that we would abide with him. It also demonstrates something we've talked about a lot here recently, and that is every one of us must do their part. The tabernacle could not exist without the gifts and the talents of the different craftsmen and artisans. They had to actually create the altar of incense. They had to build the Ark of the Covenant. They had to put these different things together. So without their gifts and talents, the Mishkan was not possible. But the craftsmen, the artisans, they couldn't do what they were supposed to do had the people not brought the different contributions. If they hadn't brought the gold and the silver and the dyes and the skins and the wood and all these different things, then the artisans could not have done their job. And the people could not have given their contributions if God had not provided the means for them to bring those contributions. So God does his part, and then he expects us to do ours. He will bless the work of our hands, but he expects our hands to work, all right? So in turn, when the people and everybody else is doing what they're supposed to be doing, it demonstrates that there are certain things that have to occur if other things are to occur. Um, I mean, this is kind of simple, I guess. You can't build a house without materials, is that right? Right? And to have the materials, somebody's got to be, have the means to pay for those materials, right? Right? But where do most of those materials come from? You know, particularly like when you think of wood, well, see, God's already taken care of that part. It's just up to us to do our part. But certain things cannot happen until certain other things are, all, are already in place, which then leads us into the idea that there are things that move in cycles. There are seasons. And one season kind of sets the stage for the next. One cycle is built on the preceding cycle. And the subsequent cycle is kind of dependent on that and so on and so on. So I could go into a lot of different examples, but the one that I, I'll use, I've used it before, is the letter Samech. How many of you are familiar with that letter? Okay. A few of you. I thought this was a Hebrew Roots congregation. <laughs> All right. So in Hebrew, there's this letter called Samech. And it looks kind of like a circle. It's got a little, uh, a little extension on the top. I don't know if anybody in the back could quickly bring up the letter. I didn't think to put that in what I sent you. If not, don't worry about it. Um, but anyway, it's, it's kind of a circle. In fact, in Hebrew script, that's the way you write it. It's a circle. And the, the thing's always intrigued me about this, the letter Samech being a circle, is the starting point up here, let's pretend, and we're going to make a circle, and we're going to come around and when we get to the end, where are we? At the beginning. So the beginning is the end. The end is the beginning. They're not separate things. They're one and the same. By the way, sidebar, Yeshua is the first and last, the beginning and the end, right? So Samich is, is a circle. It's a cycle. And so let's go around that circle again. We start at the beginning, and we come around, and we come to the end, and the end is the beginning, but the beginning of what? The next cycle. All right, we come around to the end of that cycle, and where are we? The beginning of the next one. The word samech, we, we might say ordination. In Hebrew, smicha. But you ordain somebody. Smicha, it actually means you're, you're supporting. There you go. 
There's the letter Samech. Thank you, gentlemen. But you can see it kind of looks like a circle. But in script, it, it is a circle. All right, but anyway, the word Samech, it means to support, to kind of undergird something. So the idea here is that the first cycle, whatever that is, it supports the next one. And those two support the next one, and on and on and on. So back in the day when we used to wear these things called watches. <laughs> See anybody? <laughs> All right. We still have a few people who are living in antiquity here. No. We used to have these things called watches. And before Casio and whatever else it was to come out with the digital watches, we used to have Mickey Mouse watches and Timex watches and all those kinds of things. And they had three hands on them, generally speaking. One was a second hand, one was a minute hand, and one was an hour hand. Now, for you young people, <laughs> this is back in the day when we had things called records and, uh, <laughs> and actual landline telephones, you know? You know. <laughs> anyway, here's my point. 60 seconds... That little hand ticks around every 60 seconds, makes one cycle, and what does that mean? One minute, which means that minute hand moves now. And every time that little second hand would move around 60 times, that minute hand would move again. And when that minute hand has moved around 60 times, that means the hour hand is moving around again. Here's the point. 60 seconds leads to a minute. 60 minutes leads to an hour. Several hours, 24 hours you have a day, days lead to weeks, weeks lead to months, months lead to years, centuries, you know, millennia, you get the idea. So what happens to that if when we get to the second minute, we decide to throw the first one away? It all falls apart because the second minute is supported by the first one. The third minute is supported by the second. Are you see where I'm trying to go here? By the way, the numerical value of Samic is 60. Kind of interesting. The point is, things, there are things that have to be in place in order for other things to occur. You don't put the roof on a house that doesn't have a foundation, right? There are things that have to be set in place because this is the way, this is a universal law. So relate that to what we're talking about, the sanctuary. The, there, the contributions had to be there for the people to bring. And when the, con when the contributions are brought, then the artisans and then the craftsmen can do their job. And then when they've done their job, then Moses, according to the pattern, can go put everything in its proper place just as God said it was to happen. And then when everything is in its proper place, guess who shows up? All right? The presence of the Almighty. The process began when the people brought their offerings, as far as the people's part of, the, of this process. Exodus 35, verses 4 and 5. And Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, Take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it as an offering to the Lord. So this is what we're going to kind of focus in on now. Everybody has to do their part, whatever that is. But whatever it is, it should be done with a willing heart. Not begrudgingly, not with hesitancy, it should be done with a willing heart. In fact, I would suggest that it's only with a willing heart, if it, only when it's done with a willing heart does the Creator receive that as an acceptable offering. <coughs> Cain did what he wanted to do. Abel did what God wanted him to do. And which one did God receive and which one did God reject? In fact, he had to go back and tell Cain, you know what's right. Do the right thing and I'll receive yours as well. So it has to be done with a willing heart. And this is why every Shabbat, when we give everybody an opportunity to bring their offering unto the Lord, we always precede it with saying, everybody who has a willing heart. Because God doesn't need our money, does he? God doesn't need our treasure. He wants us to come with a willing heart. So I want to read this from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the second letter to the Corinthians. Chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. He who sows sparingly 
will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So not grudgingly, I'm going to do this, but I don't really want to do it. That doesn't count, I don't think. That doesn't count. Or of necessity. And I've, I've kind of wondered what he might have meant by that. But, you know, somebody just feel, well, I have to do it. Everybody's looking. Or somebody has made me feel guilty if I don't. That happens a lot, too. But he sums it up and says, God wants people to give because they want to. It's, a, it's in their heart to do it, and they do so cheerfully. Now, again... Everybody in this room and everybody watching knows that God does not need our treasure. He does not need our money. He does not need all of those things. But what does he want? Our hearts. He wants our hearts. And so then, those who have a willing heart, bringing their contributions to what God is building, I don't think that that should be viewed as as limited to monetary items. I think it needs to include our gifts, our talents, the skills, by the way, that he gave us, right? That he invested in us. I think that means our service to him. And so that our treasure should not be defined by temporal things. Our treasure should be things that are defined that, by things that are beyond this world, beyond the here and the now. And our focus, when it's in the right place, and we're, we're considering our treasure to be something beyond what we can enjoy here. There are great benefits now, and there will be great benefits in the future. So in this instance, where the tabernacle is concerned, to connect to that particular point, the people who had a willing heart to give, who had a willing heart to serve, the reward was this. They were blessed with the presence of the Almighty God in a visible way. There was no doubt when his presence was among them, right? And so because they were willing to do this, they gave from a willing heart to serve him. They were blessed with his presence. So that then leads me to this consideration. The people are bringing their contributions. The artisans are working on the different furnishings, et cetera. And they're right in the midst of the process. And I I tend to think that even though God gave them wisdom to design these things and put them together, wisdom to me is one of those things that we have to have in order to navigate life with, um, with all the pitfalls, with all the challenges and the different um, struggles. In other words, if it was seamless and without any kind of challenge whatsoever, how much wisdom do you need to do that if it's automatic? You understand what I'm trying to say? In other words, I tend to believe that even though God gave them the wisdom to do these things, nonetheless, they were still presented with certain challenges in how do we deal with this particular issue. For instance, it took the Temple Institute decades to figure out how to manufacture a seven-branch menorah from one ingot of gold. (coughs) Took them decades. Now, they figured it out. And it took smarts and it took wisdom that comes from all night. But do you understand what I'm trying to say here? He gave them wisdom. He gave them these gifts. He gave them the skill. But that implies to me, he gave them the skill, at least in part, to be able to know how to overcome challenges. And when they were presented, how do we do this? And God would give them the wisdom to do that. Does that make sense to anybody besides me? All right. Very good. So... They're in the midst of this, and they're trying to figure all these things out and trying to put all this together, and uh, they're in the process, and they're working on something right now, but with an eye on what is to come. What is to come? God dwelling in their midst. They're looking beyond the here and now in their service because they know that something is going to come of this. There's going to be a reward for this. There's going to be a result of this. So with that in mind, I want us to consider the words of David in Psalm 31. Verse 19. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you in the presence of the sons of men. I want to read that again. Oh, how great is your goodness, 
which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you in the presence of the sons of men. And that last part, in the presence of the sons of men, seems to indicate, to me anyway, those who fear you before all men right now. But you have laid up things for them. You've laid up goodness. You've prepared goodness for those who trust you. So there is a belief within Judaism that God reveals the righteous in this world and in the world to come based on the circumstances surrounding their obedience. And here's what we mean by that. Sometimes we are called to obey God when everybody sees in a way that everybody can watch and observe. And then there are those times when God calls us to do something or not do something that nobody is going to know about. Right? So this belief is that he rewards the righteous either in this world or in the next according to their obedience and whether it was in front of everybody or whether it was just private, whether it was apparent to all or whether it was apparent to none. And so then their idea is when we do good toward our fellow man in obedience to God's instructions, then he rewards us in this life, sometimes openly, so that everybody will see the benefits of us walking in obedience. So in other words, righteous actions that are apparent to, uh, that are apparent to all are sometimes, maybe a lot of times, rewarded in a way that is visible to all. You go back to Deuteronomy, I think it's in chapter one and two, and just to kind of summarize this, He's going to put the people of Israel in a particular land surrounded by their enemies so that when Israel is walking in obedience and the land is fruitful and they are prospering and good things are happening to them, then all the nations round about them are going to say, what other nation on earth is like this? In other words, the nations would see the rewards that were given to his people for walking in obedience. They did what he asked them to do and he rewarded them openly as it were so that everybody could see. Everybody with me so far? All right. So I think that's a possible, um, I think that is something that we can see in our own lives sometimes. But on the flip side of the issue, there are those things that we are to do or sometimes not to do that no one knows about and will ever know about except the Father in heaven. And according to the Messiah, for those who do these kinds of things, guess what? He's going, to reward, he's going to reward us openly. But did he mean in this life or in the world to come? According to our Jewish friends, it's mostly in the world to come. It's like this. Just as there are certain things that we are to do, we know we are to do or not to do, that don't necessarily need to be publicized for everybody. It's done in private. Those times when nobody knows and there's this temptation or seduction to do this or not to do that, and we, we do the right thing, nobody ever knows except him. And so those duties of the heart that are hidden from others, known only to the creator, they believe that the rewards for those things are hidden right now. But we're going to be rewarded for those things in the world to come. That's why David said this, that the goodness of God is laid up for those who fear you, awaiting those who fear you. In fact, the Hebrew word there literally means hidden or treasured as if it were buried. So understand what I'm saying? How many of you know what I'm talking about, that there are times that you have to make a decision to do the right thing and nobody's gonna ever know that you were in that situation, right? Happens a lot, doesn't it, okay? But to go out and tell everybody, well, I was faced with this, and I really wanted to do that, but, you know, thankfully God helped me through that. We don't, you know, we don't generally go and tell everybody about that. Those things are private, but God recognizes it. Apparently, as a reward for that, he lays up treasure for us in the world to come. So David is suggesting that there are certain rewards for righteous living that may not be realized in this life. And by the way, if we never realize the reward for it in this life, are we still going to do it? There are things that he has laid up for us that right now we can't, we can't discern. We, these things are hidden, but they're stored up for us in the world to come. And I believe Yeshua supports this idea. 
In Matthew chapter six, we're gonna spend a little time in Matthew six here for a moment. After encouraging us to go into our secret place when fasting, he said this in verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So Messiah tells us that there are certain rewards that are laid up for us in heaven. And that's where our focus needs to be. Doing the things right now with the understanding that there are things that God has for us in the future, in the kingdom. So just as the blind cannot perceive colors, the deaf have a hard time perceiving sounds, I don't know that we fully comprehend all that God has prepared for, uh, for those who fear him. We, ha- we can't really comprehend all that awaits us. Those of us who fear him and want to serve him, as long as we're bottled up in this mortal body, it's hard for us to comprehend these things. We can't conceive of infinite rewards in a finite environment. So, a couple of notes that I made myself here, speaking to myself. Knowing this, knowing this, this, that this is a reality, that this is real, there, there is something that the Father has laid up for us. Knowing that that is real should encourage us to continue in our journey. It should provoke us to be willing to endure and to overcome all hardships because it goes back to those struggles that we have in private and then we overcome them and we endure them and we persevere through them. Whether anybody else knows or not is really not important. The one who it matters, he knows and he has laid up treasures for us in the kingdom to come. Paul said this in Romans chapter 8. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I think even in that, Paul is hinting at there are things that await us that we cannot comprehend. And anything we have to go through here and now, it just can't compare to that. And so what he has in store for us is, is worth persevering, enduring, overcoming, participating in according to his will and purpose to see beyond what is right in front of us to know that there are greater things to come. For the joy that was set before him, Messiah endured the suffering and the shame of the cross, right? He saw beyond the here and now. He saw beyond that to see what was going to come of it. And so that's something that we all need to kind of remind ourselves of, you know, reaffirm, you know, embrace if we haven't before. And remember that our contribution, our giving, our serving, all these things is not limited to things that are financial. It shouldn't, it, it shouldn't exclude all of those other things that we talked about, service, you know, the talents, the skills, the gifts, all the things that he's invested in us that we could use in his service. And our giving should not be for the sake of getting. That should not be the motivation. It should never be that if I do this, I'll get that. (laughs) I remember Brad used to say something like this. I don't know why this comes to mind, but, you know, Brad would say, you know, talk about those guys that are on the television and say, now if you send me $1,000, God's going to send you $10,000. And Brad said, you know what I always wanted to do? I wanted to write to them and say, why don't you send me a thousand dollars? Point is, we should not give whatever it is with the notion of I'm giving in order to get. We should do it with a willing heart because our heart is to serve him. And yet at the same time, he is not going to ignore the fact that we are dedicated and lovingly serving him. Our love and devotion, in other words, to our creator is not going to go unrecognized. But we still have to be able to look beyond the here and now to appreciate what he has in store for us. And I believe that we should be provoked to do as we are challenged to do right now in service to him. Even if those things are taken off the table, 
Do we love him or do we, well, or are we servants or are we hirelings? All right. Messiah made it very clear that there are indeed certain things that we are to do in private so as not to call undue attention to ourselves. So we're going to go back to the fasting issue in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16. He said, don't be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. They disfigure their faces that they may appear to be, uh, they, that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so that you, not, that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. I want to read that again. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't put on religious airs. Don't make a show for everybody to take a look at you and see how righteous you are. Because they probably don't see you that way, just to let you know. <laughs> don't disfigure your faces to appear to be as fasting. <laughs> I'm having all these little flashbacks today. Were you having a service where it came time for somebody to testify and somebody went to testify and they were like, I just want to thank the Lord because... Oh, the devil's been really whipping up on me this week. And this happened and that happened and oh Lord, but I persevered and I overcome. Oh, but the devil was really working. You know that everybody and I'm like, I was so depressed after it was all over. I was like was I supposed to be encouraged by this? Don't do that. When you fast, anoint your head, wash your face. Don't appear to men to be fast. You're, you're doing this not for men. You're doing this for your Father in heaven. And if you do this in secret, your Father who sees these things done in secret is going to, Messiah says, reward you openly. So then a heart that is willing to please the Lord does not look for the recognition of men. I want to say that again. A willing heart that wants to serve the Lord is not looking for recognition from men. And those who are looking for that kind of recognition, those who do publicly what they should have done privately, have already received their reward. And you know what that is? They got the recognition of men, which amounts to nothing because it's passing away, it's temporal. And so what we want to do is seek our Father's recognition, His acknowledgement, His approval on what we're doing. And in time, Messiah says that he will reward us openly. But again, does that necessarily mean in this life or is he speaking of in the world to come? I think it's probably the latter because he doesn't want us focused on this world, does he? And by that, you, you understand what I mean? His kingdom is not of this world. It's not associated with the things of this world, even though we are in this world. But where should our focus be? It should be on his kingdom, right? So he's reminding us that beyond this life, there is much more to come. And what is to come is exceedingly superior to anything that you and I could experience now. So I'm going to go and quote Paul again, who was quoting scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him, or as David said, fear him. He has laid up these things for those who fear him, those who love him. And we can't, according to Paul, we can't even imagine it. We haven't seen it. We haven't heard it. We haven't imagined it. So then, it leads me to this question. Is it better to receive a reward here? Or is it better to receive a reward, a reward in the coming kingdom, one that we can't even comprehend? Number two? Okay. <laughs> I don't think there's a door number three. It's one or it's two. It's A or it's B. All right, that's a no-brainer. It's better to receive what he has in store for us in the world to come. But if we really believe that, then we need to conduct ourselves appropriately. We need to conduct ourselves in a way that is pleasing to him and not pleasing necessarily to men, right? So I think it's better to await what he has stored up for us to be made priests and kings 
that's better than anything that you and I could enjoy in this present world, which is passing away. So one day, all of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of the Messiah, and we're going to have to give an account of all those things that we've done, right? And do you remember what Paul said about some of those things? What happens to them? They get burned up like wood, hay, and stubble. Things that are temporal, things that don't last, things that are not eternal. And the only thing that's really going to remain are those things that are eternal, those things that are pleasing to him. So we need to be faithful in our service at all times, whether it's in private, whether it's in public, or as David said, in the presence of the sons of men. And that idea brings us back to this. There are deeds that Messiah said that we are to perform in private, but there are things that we're supposed to do so that everybody sees, so that everybody can be witness to it. And as we do these things, it should never be intended to bring attention and glory to ourselves, but to the Father always, right? Because if it's bringing too much attention to me or to you, something might be a little out of whack, all right? It's to always bring glory to him. And so in this same section of Matthew that we've been discussing, here's what Messiah said in verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. He wants men to see your good works. Why? That they may glorify your Father in heaven. So there are things that we are to do in private, and he will reward us openly. Then there are things that we're to do in public so that everybody sees it, so that our Father in heaven is glorified. That is so that you and I will be the light in the midst of the darkness. The light in us is what they're supposed to see. Not darkness, but the light, the reflection of the Messiah in our life. It's no longer I who lives, but the Messiah who lives in me. His word abiding in me. That is what is to be displayed for everybody to see. And not to hide it under the bed or, you know, um, be the city that can't be uh, seen. We need to put it out there for everybody to see. And it should be done with a willing heart. People should see humility in us. This is kind of, uh, people make a joke out of it, but it, it is really sad when you think about it. Um, our older sons, a long time ago, used to work in you know, restaurants and serving tables, and I know we've got people in here who've done that in times past. And they used to tell us all the time that the worst tippers, church people, Hmm? Oh, I thought you said something. That, that is right, though, right? That's what they said. And Mary said it. It must be true. So, <laughs> and, you know, they kind of said it jokingly, but I thought about that. I, I, that's awful. That's awful. That, that is, a, I mean, I know that's maybe low on your list of important things, but it says something on a grander scale. That should not be our witness, okay? We should be sharing light. We should be a reflection of who and what the Messiah is. That needs to be on display for everybody to see. Why? Because in this particular scenario, it is possible that somebody could look down on God because a bad representation from God's people. That is not the right way to go about things. When we encounter people... It should be that when that exchange ends, that they have a very positive view of the one we say we serve. It shouldn't be really hard for us to do that. Well, let me, let me rephrase that. It shouldn't be hard for us to recognize that that's what we need to do. To do it, to actually execute it, yeah, that might be a little difficult sometimes in certain situations. But the point is, is that we are here to be his ambassadors and his representatives. And so if we're going to serve him and to help build what he has asked us to build, it has to be done with a willing heart. It has to be done the way he's asked us to do it, with humility, with generous hearts. In fact, that takes us to, we're back in Matthew 6 again, verse 22. Are y'all still awake? <laughs> this side I kind of heard, this side not so much. That's, oh, that's where all the young people are. Oh, no, y'all wake up, wake up. I'm just playing, playing, playing. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 no. 
<laughs> Verse 22, Matthew 6. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. And so we're supposed to be light, so it would be helpful if our whole body was full of light. Would you agree with that? All right, so we need to have a good eye. Your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God, who is eternal, who is spiritual, and be in love with things that are temporal and finite. It's not just money. It's things that are temporal, things that are passing away. So what is he talking about here? The eye is good. It could also be rendered if your eyesight is good. But what does he mean by that? It is a Hebrew idiom to express someone who is generous, someone who gives of themselves, gives of their resources, whether that is money or not but they give of themselves. They're a generous person. They're a helpful person. They're a considerate person. They, they do this with a willing heart. Messiah says that is having a good eye, and if you're that kind of a person, then that means your whole body is full of light, and light is what we're supposed to be. And then the opposite of that is what? How great is that darkness? If we're stingy, whether it's money, time, whatever it is, if we're stingy, and possessive of it, Messiah says that your whole body is full of darkness, which means you can't be light. So, again, this isn't limited to money. It's not limited to almsgiving, uh, almsgiving, but that is part of it as well. Because the thing that we so desperately want to hold on to, whatever that is, if it's not eternal, if it does not support his purpose and kingdom, well... It's temporal, it's worldly, it's earthly. But let's go back to the money thing. That's when everybody starts squirming. (laughs) But here's something to consider. In Acts chapter 10, it's, it's, um, you know, Peter's in Jaffa, he's on Simon the Tanner's house, he's on top of the roof, he has the vision, you know, the vision that comes down, the, the creeping things and the unclean things and the sheet three times, and he's told to eat those things, which means we can eat everything we want. <laughs> Sarcasm, okay? But anyway, you know the story how he goes to the house of Cornelius. He's very hesitant to do it, but God has shown me that I should call no man common that God has cleansed. And he goes into his house and brings the good news to him. And God visits that household. But prior to Peter getting there, an angel visits Cornelius, who is not Jewish. He's a Roman. But the angel says, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. And because he was a praying praying man, because he was a considerate man, a generous man, doing these good things that maybe nobody knew about, but God was keeping record of it. And one day, all those things that God had laid up for him, he says, okay, now it's time for you to be rewarded. And what was the reward? That his household would be visited by the presence of God. That's a pretty good reward, right? So the point is here, to be generous is to be full of light. To be stingy is to be full of darkness. And if we are stingy with the very thing that God has given us, to serve his purpose, and we're stingy with that, kind of makes me wonder if he won't be a little hesitant to release all those other things that he was willing to give us. Were we to use those gifts, talents, skills, resources for the reason he gave them to us? Did that come out right? You understand what I'm saying? Our stinginess might be preventing God from doing other things that he wants to do or laying up things for us. So then... Am I, am I making sense? Are you following me? Are you? All right. Very good. Sorry. Hold on.
Okay. All right. Pause. All right. Just to kind of let you know, we're good. Okay. If you if you hear wait a minute if you hear an alarm go off, don't panic. Okay. That's something that may happen, but just ignore it. Everything's good. The water's getting shut off, so we should be in good shape. Okay. But if you hear the alarm, don't freak. You know, don't be looking for the exit. It it's all good. Now, if it gets so loud that we can't. Well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> what was I talking about? All right. We're talking about God's house. We're talking about building that which he has, he's given us to do. And how when, when we come to him and to bring our contributions and our efforts and all those things, it must be given out of a willing heart, not stingy, not being full of darkness, not having the bad eye, so to speak, but having the good eye, being willing to be generous with everything that God has given us, ourselves. And so it's about the condition of our heart and our willingness to surrender what's in our hand for a greater purpose. The artisans are an example of that. Exodus 35, verse 10. It says that all who are gifted artisans among you shall come and make all that the Lord has commanded. All of the gifted artisans shall come and make all that the Lord has commanded. Again, they can't do that unless the people have brought their contributions. God's done his part. Now it's time for the people to do their part. So here's a question I had. Where did these artisans like Bezalel and Aholiov, who are out in the wilderness, where did they learn their craft? In Egypt, right? Or let's put it this way, in the secular world. They learn things, skills, talents, things that were learned in the secular world, skills that we may not immediately recognize as being useful in the kingdom. Where's Mavis? There you are. Skills and talents that we, you know, at first glance may not, well, I don't know how this is going to work out in the kingdom. How does this contribute to what God is doing, what his purposes are for? But no experience is wasted. <laughs> No experience is wasted. In, in fact, even the worst of circumstances, what happens? God can turn that around for good. He can take things that were meant for evil and he can make them for good. Ask Joseph, right? And so again, sometimes it's, you know, we may feel like, I don't really see how this can be useful, but it might be the father's way of saying, Daniel son, wax on, wax off, right? So no experience should be considered as wasted. So he says here, every wise-hearted man, let him come and make all these things that the Lord has commanded. And so he gave them the ability to know how to appropriate the gifts that they had been given. Verse 30, and the Lord said to the children of Israel, see, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and understanding in, all, in knowledge, in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works. God called Bezalel, and it will go on and mention Oholiab as well, but he called them by name. That to me means that he had specifically ordained that these men and others who aren't named necessarily, specifically ordained that these are the people that are going to play this particular role. And that means he endowed them with a gift that was predestined. Not only was the person predestined, but the gift, the talent, the skill was predestined for a particular purpose. And if it were true for them, should we not consider that that is true for us as well? That not only were you as a person purposed for a particular role in the kingdom, but those gifts and talents also were purposed to be used in the kingdom. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yeshua for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. <laughs> He's, he created us, and with the creation, he also gave us the skills and talents that we're going to need, 
But it's, it seems to say here that he's also created the good works that we're supposed to do. It's all pre-planned. It's all purposed. It's just really up to us whether or not we have a willing heart to walk in those things. We've been given these gifts from birth. We've been given skills through experience, even in the secular world, but all of it coming together in order to perform the works that only we were meant to do. Only you were meant to do. I can't do what you were purposed to do, and likewise. And that's why it's important for, I guess, I'll get it out here in a minute. It's important for all of us to see, once again, that everybody has value, as Beth said. Everybody, young and old, everyone has purpose. Every has, everyone has a role to play in the Father's kingdom. And the gifts that he's given us are without repentance. He doesn't change his mind. Sometimes things happen in life that we did not expect. I did not expect to be told that the uh, sprinkler system might go off at any moment. <laughs> and so we had to kind of make some decisions. And we decided, you know what? Circumstances do not change what God has called us to do. I know that's a very minor thing. But the point is, circumstances, unexpected circumstances, do not change what we have been called to do. It might be that some of those unexpected circumstances don't derail the purpose, but actually advance the purpose, which is kind of hard for us to see sometimes. I go back to Joseph. What you intended for evil, God meant for good. So we've all been given these talents and skills, and these men, it says, they were to design artistic works, which is literally to think thoughts, which I find very interesting. So I'm almost done here. Are y'all still with me? Or are y'all thinking about that sprinkler? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. What was it the scarecrow th said? You know, the, some of the, you know, name anyway. <laughs> to think thoughts. Very interesting. There are a lot of people that feel that there is no art in Judaism, and they base this on the fact that we're told that you are to make no graven images. However, I would suggest to you that poetry is an art. Psalms is a book of poetry. Some people consider the book of Job to be a book of poetry. I mean, how could we say that there is no art in the kingdom when God is the greatest of all artists, right? I mean, he designed all this. He he made all of this. And so obviously he is an artist. Here's the difference. In the West, we focus on beauty. God focuses on righteousness, doing what is right. And so then the highest artist is not one who is the greatest in self-expression. The most esteemed artist is the one who is greatest in self-control. Saying no to self in order to use the gifts, the talents, the skills, the resources to advance his purpose, his kingdom, to build what he wants built. The, the tabernacle is a picture of that. God gave them the blueprint, gave them the design, and gave them the purpose. Now, you do it. I've given you all the tools to work with. Now, make it happen. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to give you wisdom to do the things and overcome the challenges. Nevertheless, it is up to you to build this. And so self-control allowed access to the greatest artist of all. Because when everybody did what they were supposed to do, the reward was what? His presence among them. So Bezalel, Oholiab, and all these people were not expressing their own imagination. They didn't just take liberties and say, well, this is what I see you know, and take some paint and throw it against the canvas and go, oh, art. <laughs> no, they follow the pattern of what God had given them. They didn't express, express their own imagination. They expressed God's purpose. And in expressing God's purpose, they were allowed to teach others, even to this day. God placed the gift in them. He placed within their heart a willingness to do this, the wisdom, all those things. And as they did this, it teaches others. We're still talking about it right now. 3,500 years later, we're still looking at what they did by God's grace and all the gifts that he gave them. We're still talking about it, still analyzing it. You know, 
people like Howard get up here and talk about the temple and all the different components. And we've been doing that for 3,500 years. We'll be doing that till the Messiah comes because it is an expression of God's will and purpose. So he was teaching the things that God had placed in his heart. By skillful craftsmanship, by wisdom, he was able to inspire others just like he continues to inspire us today. So we'll close with the... We... <laughs> no. It was hard enough the first time. We'll close with these thoughts. A light that cannot kindle another is a weak light. All right? Biblically speaking, the core of art is teaching and inspiring others. Not to, you know, be uh, mesmerized by beauty, but by purpose. You know? What is it that God is teaching us through what he's trying to build? And he gives us wisdom to understand his patterns so that we can, you know, appropriate those principles to our, our own lives, but that through our own lives, hopefully we teach others. We're being that light, Right? A light that can't kindle another is a weak light. We have to be a light strong enough to kindle light in others. We need to be able to teach and inspire others to understand the pattern that God has given us all. And then they in turn go out and teach. Basically discipling. We're not called to be maker, uh, make converts. We're called to make disciples, right? So a light illuminating more light until it culminates in our purpose to be a light in the darkness. So when we use these gifts, when we use these talents that he's given to us, it furthers God's purpose. He is sovereign. He is eternal. And knowing that should provoke our service. Above all things, we need to acknowledge that he is the Lord our God who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He is God. He is sovereign. There is no one beside him. That has to be established first. But then when that is established in our hearts, then we should be provoked to serve him with a willing heart. And we need to be able to see during the difficult times that what we're doing right now, there's more beyond this. There's something to come. We may be having to struggle through things, work through things, overcome things, persevere right now. Probably right up until the time the Messiah returns, we're going to have to do that. But we do that now because there is something greater to come. We have to be able to look beyond the here and now to see ahead to what God is in store for us. And I believe that there are things if, that every one of us, individuals, this congregation, the body at large, I believe that there's things that he wants to do in and through us in this present world. But even if he doesn't, we need to serve him with a willing heart because there is another world to come, right? There is a greater future, right? Amen.